Hey everybody. Well, recently, once again, I celebrated my birthday. And just like all the other years I've been on YouTube, thought I'd show you guys the things I picked up for myself. Or received as gifts. And I guess we'll start with this. Um, nothing fancy. Just a sort of cheaper-ish camera bag for this camera here. Uh, I actually found this at a store called American Science and Surplus and I know I've mentioned this in other birthday videos like this and uh, well to anyone who hasn't seen those I guess the best way I would choose to describe this science and surplus place would be if you combined a science lab a junk shop and a toy store all into one that's pretty much what you'd get I mean they've got big fancy scientific gear like telescopes and microscopes and beakers and vials and uh, all sorts of testing equipment like that and then they've got sort of like electrical wiring equipment and hardware stuff like that nuts bolts screws and they got like random weird toys educational toys and just a ton of different odds and ends all over the place and one of the things I found here, of course, was this camera bag. Only cost, I think, like three or four bucks at the most, and it's decent. It's got two separate compartments in here, one for the camera and then one for my accessories or whatever. Figure I should be able to make use of it just to store the camera at least uh, while I'm not using it. But also from that store, I found a good amount of modeling supplies. Sort of unofficial modeling supplies, but they work just the same. I found a bunch of these little jars. Uh, each one was a quarter. So I picked up a good number of those. And I can use these to store paints or something. Uh, smaller amounts of paint. I found... A bunch of these eyedropper thingies and these are good for measuring out and mixing different paints together um, you know paint and thinner together I think each one of these was like 12 cents so I got I don't know like 12 of them at least a good bunch of them and these uh, these came originally in these sort of milky white translucent wrappers, so I didn't really see just exactly what they were uh, until I was able to read some of the embossed lettering on here. And these are uh, medical specimen jars. Yeah. Uh, so... The only reason I picked them up is because I noticed that they had these measuring grids here so that I can use these to mix and measure larger quantities of paint for storage. A uh, couple other things from that store. Uh, picked up a few more of these alligator clips just because that's where I usually find them. You know, I've got a bunch of them already, but I figure if I want to mount more parts at a time I might as well pick up one more pack couldn't hurt and one more thing from that place this big box well a little box but it's full of 600 count q-tips I am never gonna need q-tips again and of course these are good for panel lining when you do the inking method and then you clean it up with the q-tips and well now I will not go wanting in terms of q-tipage part of why I got so many uh, paint uh, variety goods is because many of you already know that I picked up this Badger Anthem 155 airbrush a little while back now I've been using this on my Master Grade GUF version 2.0 work in progress videos, so anybody who's been watching those has seen this thing in action. And I have to say it's been working pretty well. It's a set that came with the brush 
three jars, uh, one of which has this sort of adapter for the uh, airbrush on the cap. Then it comes with a little metal color cup that's for mixing up very small quantities of paint or maybe uh, just cleaning it out with some thinner. And it also comes with a hose, so that was good. The only thing missing is the compressor, but I had that already since Christmas, and now that I have the airbrush, I'm finally able to use it. So that's part of why I got so many jars and measuring paint devices. But also, I picked up a good amount of paint specifically for my airbrush. And I started looking in my hobby shop at these. These uh, auto air colors and these Createx airbrush colors. And uh, the first one I got was this fluorescent red. And I figure, since I'm such a neon buff, I can't go wrong getting a, a neon red for my airbrush. I can play around with that, see how well it works. And hopefully, if this stuff sticks well enough to the plastic or, or primer, uh, I should be able to make some use of this. But I know I've heard some negative things from uh, certain people, but I figured I'd give them a try myself and see how they worked. This you already saw. This, um, they call it pearl copper. And I think it looks more like a frosty gold. And it's pretty nice. It's yellowy. It's uh, saturated. The shine is pretty nice, especially through an airbrush. Uh, this is the one that I've tried through an airbrush. I haven't tried the others yet. But it looks nice, and hopefully I'll be able to make some use of it eventually on some kind of a model. Also, I found this transparent burgundy from the same variety of paint. Now, I've sampled this on a brush, regular hand brush, uh, thinned it out just a little bit to see how it looks, and it really is transparent. It looks opaque in here, you know, solid, but it does go on transparent. Not perhaps as well as something like uh, Tamiya Clear paints. Uh, those are probably the best for you know, painting clear parts and things like that, but I might be able to achieve some kind of good candy coat effect with this paint. But I'm gonna have to try it out to be sure. And one more paint from that variety. This iridescent electric blue. And the standard color of the paint is sort of like a uh, ultraviolet blue. But you'll notice how there is this really cool purple shine pearlescent color sheen to it and well that was just cool to me so I figured even if I don't use it on a model it would be fun to play around with this and um, anyway to clean out my airbrush when I was done playing with those things I picked up a couple bottles of this airbrush cleaner from the same brand I'm sure there probably are uh, more unofficial cost-effective ways of cleaning the airbrush with from those paints but before I knew what it was I wasn't gonna go pressing my luck and play it safe rather than sorry so I picked up a couple of these just to be sure that I could clean it out afterwards but if some of you do know what I could use to clean out these paints from an airbrush um, let me know uh, but the paints are not done yet. We still have a few more. I guess first we'll start with these testers model masters and I picked up this light ghost gray. Pretty nice. This I can't even begin to pronounce that name. Uh, Schlocken brown and stuff and something or other and call it dark dark brown. And this, this uh, Signal Brown. And um, I figure between all three of these paints, I should maybe be able to achieve some kind of um, desert type color scheme on some model or another. So I figured that would be cool to get. 
And moving on to Tester's Floquil paints. Uh, first of all, I picked up more of my new favorite paint, the Floquil Bright Silver. And now any of you who have seen my Master Grade Goof Work in Progress videos know how good this paint looks. I figure, now that I have a second jar, I first of all don't have to worry about running out of my first jar, but even if I don't run out, I'll have more on hand for any other projects I want to use it on. Because this paint is just too, too good to not have on hand. I love it. And one other paint, similar to that, that I picked up was a Floquil Copper. Now, they call this some kind of pearl copper. Uh, no. That's copper. That looks like a penny. So, flowing this thing through an airbrush, yeah, that's going to be cool. And I, I don't see too many models with copper on them, especially not as some main color. So I think I might try that sometime, and I hope to uh, have some fun with it. Now the last couple paints here, I actually found at Walmart. Rust-Oleum, Gloss White, and Gloss Black. Now, I know that Vegeta8259, he uses these paints through his airbrush. He used to use them in spray can form, and he's pretty much stood by the paint and the brand all along. But now that he had an airbrush, he's been using from these tins. Uh, and to mix it up, he's been using um, regular old uh, like store-bought paint thinner. And I went and I got myself a big jug of this. I would imagine it is the same. It's called Safer Paint Thinner, and it's like low odor and somehow otherwise safer, renewable content, etc. Says it's some kind of like milky color, I think, somewhere on here. Um, and I'm pretty sure they say it uh, dries clear or something, I, I hope. But, you know, I'll try it out. I'll see how it works. And if, even if it doesn't work, um, this only cost me four bucks or so. Whereas a dinky little jar of uh, testers enamel thinner, which is maybe a, only a little bigger than this kind of a jar, that cost me three bucks. So it's good to buy in bulk. And as far as I'm aware, this will work. Not only for this but the other enamel paints as well. All those Model Master and Floquil paints that I bought. Uh, anyway, I figured I would give these a try and hope they work out. Now, moving on. Oh yes, I also, from Walmart, found these three sets of sandpaper. I found them in the automotive department instead of the paint and hardware department. I first got a pack of 400 grit, um, 800 grit, and 1000 grit. So I figure if you ever come across any big, nasty, awful seam lines that I need to clean up, I should be able to do it with these which are much finer grit sandpapers than um, your typical hardware uh, paint stripping sandpaper from you know, the hardware department. Now, moving on to some other stuff. I was at my local used disc store and I saw something that I had only seen once, or no, a bunch of times, when I was a kid, I found a copy of The Never Ending Story on DVD. Now, like I said, I watched this all the time when I was a kid. I didn't understand a lot of it though. I was pretty uh, young when I started watching this. So I basically just remembered the imagery, some of the character names, and some of the faces and places and things like that but not a lot about what the story was really all about. So I figured when I saw this, it was like, you know what? 
I could use a trip down memory lane. I kind of expected it to end up like how, you know, when you imagine something from your childhood or, or earlier on in your life, and the way you remember it might not be as good as it actually really was, but it was just that it seemed better because you were a kid or something like that. Actually, I would say this movie went the opposite direction. Of course, because I didn't know very much about the movie from being a kid, a lot of it didn't make sense. Seeing it now as an adult, it's actually not too bad. It, it doesn't, like, try to insult your intelligence. It tries to tell an interesting, moderately light-hearted story, but it's really pretty good. I like it. I mean, I liked it more than I thought I was going to like it being an adult now. And it's got this sort of weird 70s, 80s type movie style. You know, the special effects are not fantastic. They're a little uh, makeshift, if you will. But it sort of adds a certain charm to the movie. It just, it feels good. Just different and interesting and like it's got substance. So if you like, you know, movies based on stories or fantasy or imagination or weird creatures or weird fantasy worlds and all that kind of crap, uh, check this out. It's actually pretty decent, I think. And speaking of books and stories, I wound up at a Barnes & Noble. And I was looking through the science fiction section, and I found this copy of H.G. Wells' The Island of Dr. Moreau. Now, I remember, and probably you do too, that there was a movie made about this in about the mid-90s. Well, at the time, I only knew the movie for the movie. I thought it was an original thing. I liked it. thought it was pretty interesting. Uh, and then it was a couple years after that that I think I learned that that movie from the 90s was actually a remake of a movie from earlier on. I don't remember when or even who was in it, and I never even saw it. But it wasn't until I saw this book that I even knew the whole story itself came from a book, and much less that it was by H.G. Wells. See, because I knew him or his stories through, um, like, The Time Machine. That was one of my favorite st stories when I was younger, and um, I figured I would check out his section, see what he was doing uh, other than that, and I was surprised to find this title. So, seeing how 90% of the time uh, the books are better than the movies, I figured I would check this out and see what it was like. And the premise, um, as described on the book, says, or sounds pretty good. So. Might make for a good uh, summer read. One more sort of uh, modeling supply type oddity that I found in my hobby shop. Something I just could not pass up. I don't even know if I'll be able to use it for anything, but I found this big sheet of gold foil poster board. Very cool, though. And I might be able to use this for something. I don't know what. Maybe nothing. But hopefully something. But anyway, now on to what most of you probably care most about. Models. Now, I only have a couple to show you, but they're sort of old and rare, unique kind of models. And I'm pretty pleased to have found them. Uh, the first of which being this. This 144th scale God Gundam model kit. Now I spotted this in my hobby shop and I just checked it out out of curiosity and nostalgia. But when I looked closer, I noticed that it wasn't the standard type. It was the hyper mode variety. This guy, the shop owner, uh, unknowingly purchased and ordered and stocked in all of the Hyper Mode G Gundam 144th scale kits. Now, they were 11 bucks each, so I couldn't spring for all of them. 
and uh, they only had one uh, G Gundam left. So I decided to go with this, seeing as it was the most rare of them. And what makes the hyper mode hyper mode is the gold plating on the parts. And you can see how they got a little cheap by only plating one side on some of the runners. So, uh, this isn't something that I think I would build um, as being some kind of practical and attractive display piece. More, I think, I would keep this as a novelty item. Just like uh, my five-in-one uh, grade-up set for these same G Gundam 44th scale kits. So I guess I have sort of unofficially started a small collection of rare G Gundam collectibles, and I'm glad to have this as part of it. And the other model that I found at the same place, which is also sort of a rarity and very much a steal in my opinion, this old high-grade 1 100th scale Rising Gundam. Sort of has that Shining Gundam vibe, and uh, was something that I really never got my hands on. So seeing this, sitting there, being such a rare old item, I couldn't pass it up. But it only cost 22 bucks. I mean, the suggested yen price is only 1500 and go figure at today's exchange rate, you might be talking somewhere around the ballpark of 20 bucks. So, why that's such a good deal is because usually, when you get stuff from the model shop or the hobby shop, they bump up the prices to compensate for shipping and tax and all that. But apparently that add-on of price didn't really make much of a difference here, or they just didn't choose to bump the price up that much. So I figured this was a pretty good deal, especially considering I can't really find it much of anywhere else. And something interesting about model kits from this 1100 scale G Gundam line is as you'll see here, you'll notice how these parts are already multicolored. That's not like how some, you know, like Robot Damashi or uh, things like that you know, they uh, pre-paint the figures like that. It's not paint. It's injection molding with different sections of the frame being molded in different color. And the way they all sort of sandwich together, as you can see on this torso, sort of blends them together all in one. So you don't have to, A, assemble different parts that are different colors and you know, you've already, you don't have to paint anything either. But of course, for anybody who does want to paint their models, uh, this only makes things more difficult. Which I think is part of why they made this uh, obsolete. But, anyway. Whether or not I paint it, I think this one I might build. Uh, but it's not on my top priority list at the moment. Uh, I'm just glad to have it for now, and uh, I'll build it when the time comes. And anyway, that's about all to show for now, except that I will be receiving a package one of these days shortly. So when that gets here, I will continue with this video and show you what I got. So stay tuned for that. And, well, I didn't have to wait long because the same day I did that first part of the video, my package arrived. So, let's go ahead and open her up. Now this package came from Gundam Store and more. 
And the first thing I picked up was the 1 100 scale no grade Hail Buster. I always kind of like this design. Always enjoyed the look of the Buster Gundam. I like those shoulder Gatling cannons. I know nothing about the manga, but well, I figured <clears throat> it would be fun to get this. And I also got, along similar lines, the one 100 scale no grade Vent Savior. I have not had a 1 100 scale version of the Savior Gundam and it is one of those designs that I do rather like. Um, this one does come with some added stuff and the color is kind of nice. Um, but I suppose that doesn't matter much because I'll probably be painting these anyway at some point. Um, but yeah, glad to have these. They should be fun builds, but might not build them for a while yet. As for the reason why, well, you'll see eventually. Anyway, hope you've enjoyed the video. Hope you liked the stuff I got and showed you guys. And until the next time, catch you later, everybody.